Hello, my name is Sunny Ware. I'm an information security architect and web application penetration tester. Thanks for coming to my talk, Exploits, the Biggest Threat You Know Nothing About. So all of us have consumer needs and we go out to the internet and we Google, let's say, looking for a camera in this instance, and we see some result sets return. We see a camera of interest, and so we click the link to find out more information. Unfortunately, instead of getting the details about the camera of interest, we are greeted with something like this. All of your personal files are encrypted, and you have to pay 1.2 Bitcoin if you want them back. Of course, this is equivalent to about $500. Now, hopefully by the end of this talk, you will be in a much better position to possibly prevent this. And instead of seeing this message, you maybe would have seen something like this that basically lets you know, hey, watch out. This Google Ads Services.com that's found in Peter Lowe's ad server list is actually a known malicious link. So what exactly are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about drive-by malware downloads. We're also talking about malicious advertising, also known as malvertising. We're talking about spam campaigns as well, which is the delivery of malware through email. And of course, we can talk about ransomware. All of these things have in common the delivery mechanism, which is an exploit kit. Now, what exactly is an exploit kit? Well, an exploit kit is a crimeware that neatly packages up various types of exploits together, including the delivery mechanism for these exploits. And of course, the primary target is going to be people's browsers. Now, if we go through the infection process, we start very simply and benignly with a user visiting a legitimate website. On that site, there happens to be a malvertising ad. Now, there's nothing that would indicate that it is malvolent in any way. What the user doesn't realize is behind the scenes, there are several checks that are being done against their browser to determine if there are vulnerabilities to be exploited. At which point, if there are, then that user is redirected to wherever the landing pages of the exploit kit at which time there's another scan done of the person's browser, of their operating system, etc., to determine which particular exploit that the kit will go after. And then, of course, the exploit is done and the malware is dropped on the system. Now, one thing to realize is that in this process, every step of this can be entirely invisible from a user's perspective. And this is a bit different from attacks that we've seen in other areas. Now, if you check out the workflow, a couple of things to point out. One is that the malvertising, in order to do subsequent hops between domains, needs to have infected or compromised sites as well as domains in order for this infrastructure to live. Now, there are a series of various redirects that can be done prior to actually landing on the exploit kit page. But once there, of course, the particular vulnerability, and there are some favorites that we'll look at, but the particular vulnerability is identified. The malware is actually done in two stages. There's the dropper, which is sort of the staging process that's done, and then the actual payload is delivered. Now, in order to really understand this process, we need to go through some terms. Gate, landing page, exploit kit, payloads. So the gate is your redirection. This is happening behind the scenes, maybe way down in the corner or transparently on an iframe. In this particular example, it is an iframe that is handling the redirect or a gate here. And you can see that it's pointing to a known malicious URL. Now the landing page where the exploit kit is actually residing is going to probe your browser and version, the plugins and versions, the operating system type as well as the version, and may even try to determine what particular site that you came from. 
Now the hook, this is where we actually have the payload delivered and we have our victim. Now the possible payloads available can include, of course I spoke of the, the droppers, the first stage, but that can be followed by ransomware, trojans, spyware, or adware. Now exploit kit platforms themselves are very sophisticated. They have full development teams working on the different components that make up the exploit kit itself. Now the major assembly parts in order to pull off the creation of an exploit kit include hosting IP addresses and domains, of course identifying particular exploits that you're going to go after, identifying the, the delivery mechanism of those exploits, as well as the payload itself. Now one thing that you have to get your head around is this is a very componentized business where parts of the exploit kit are actually done by third parties. For example, you can have malvertising as a service. These service providers do nothing but ensure that traffic comes to your gate or traffic comes to your exploit kit. You can also, of course, have malware as a service. These shops focus on nothing but the building and kitting up and obfuscation of malware. Now this is a big business, this is not script kitty stuff, and it has big numbers behind it as we'll see. If we take a look at this information in regards to the exploit kit, we can see that out of 147 redirection servers that are running per month, Angular was targeting 90,000 people per day. If only 10% were served exploits, and of those exploits served, not even 3% were paying an average ransom of about $300. That still equates to about $34 million on the conservative side, which is about $3 million a month. So as you can see, there's a lot of money to be made in exploit kits. Now, as time has gone on, the exploit kits have had to have more evasive maneuvers. They include domain shadowing, which is compromised domains that are used as jumping points to finally get to landing pages. 302 cushioning, a 302 of course is a redirect. What's interesting about a redirect is that a lot of times network traffic analyzers will not really pay attention to 302s. And so a lot of the traffic being redirected to the gates and the landing pages can get lost in the noise. And also another evasive maneuver is this custom encryption payload. This is an abuse of the Diffie-Hellman public key encryption. In order to encrypt the traffic between the dropped malware payload and the communication back to the command and control. Now, one question you should ask yourself is have you actually interacted with an exploit kit? Well, how do you answer the following questions? Have you ever gone to a website where there was malicious ads? And generally this is on the lesser known retail websites. How about an infected WordPress site where maybe you've posted a blog? Do you happen to have the Java Runtime plugin inside of your browser? Do you happen to have the Adobe Reader plugin? How about Flash? Do you still have Apple QuickTime installed on your system? So in order to avoid situations where you receive a message that says, all of your files were protected by a strong encryption with AES, now follow all of these instructions. In order to avoid such a thing, we need to start looking at what kind of protections we can do to defend ourselves. Now obviously the result of paying the ransom is that you hope to get your unencrypted files back. Another option that is now appearing is instead of paying the ransom, you could actually work for the exploit kit makers by allowing your particular browser to be used as another jump point. Let's take a look at the threats landscape and what types of exploit kits we're talking about. If we take a look at this, this is one of the original exploit kits called Black Hole. You can see that as a renter of an exploit kit, you receive an account, you log into your account, and then you're able to see all sorts of statistics about the types of, types of browsers that are getting infected, the types of operating systems that are getting infected, and the particular payloads that are actually working. Now, exploit kits today, or of recent days, 
that we'll talk about include Angular, Rig, Nuclear, and Neutrino. Now Angular, of course, is no longer uh, available on the market due to key incarcerations, but some of its main characteristics included the targeting of Flash and Java vulnerabilities, as well as a JavaScript function called Get Cola IO that always seemed to be in the deobfuscated code. Rig tends to use PHP as its as its programming language of choice. It executes a malware on a legitimate site and then redirects its victims to a gate. In this particular example, we can see that in the malvertising, there is a source that's referencing a gate. Taken to the gate, there'll be some probing done via this malicious iframe. Of course, this malicious iframe was injected on a website that had a cross-site scripting or a clickjacking vulnerability, and then the gate was able to be created. From there, of course, it'll take the victim to the landing page where we have a script that's actually going to execute some VB script on the victim's machine, probably targeting Silverlight or something like that. But as you can see, the payload is, is quite obfuscated and very difficult to read. Now the characteristics for rig include that the payload is always separated from the landing page and it likes to hide inside of windows looking legitimate. For example, it might be called defsrag exe instead of defrag exe and it tends to install under slash temp instead of the normal system 32. Nuclear, the characteristics include the targeting of flash, silverlight PDF and IE exploits and it does launch advanced pieces of malware and of course ransomware. If we take a look at a particular example of nuclear where there was an Adobe Flash Player vulnerability that was basically exploited through some hijacked GoDaddy domains. The gates were performed using iframe injections that were in injected into legitimate websites that had vulnerabilities. And the Final payload was ransomware. Neutrino likes to target websites that run over port 80 and generally targets the uh, JRE plugin. Now, as you can see, there's commonalities among all of these as far as the particular types of exploits that it favors. So our challenge is how do we deal with an exploit kit that might drop ransomware that wants to be paid in Bitcoin and has delivery through Tor or Onion router type mechanisms. Let's take a look at our defenses. So first, to an organization, in regards to the people, the user awareness training needs to be concrete. It needs to give people actual to-dos, things to look for that will help them, tools that will help them. Secure coding is very important because, as you can see, these compromised domains as well as legitimate websites had web application vulnerabilities within them. And of course, attendance to security conferences like this in order to have more awareness. Now, processes always incorporate web security within your SDLC, and this should include static and dynamic analysis of your code. Manual penetration testing, which includes great experience and background. Now products, of course, we've got our network layers, the firewalls and IDS and IPSs and proxy servers. There's also some new products that have some interesting ideas. For example, Bromium has a product that can contain malware in a mini VM. Uh, Silence was very instrumental in rounding up some of the SamSam -Sam ransomware that targeted hospitals. And InGame has an interesting pro product that targets at a hardware level to address zero days. The dissemination of malware information sharing is getting a bit better. There are some organizations that have been created to try to help this. Taxi Sticks and Cybox, these are not just organizations that do talking, but Taxi is an actual infrastructure with a publish and subscribe type mechanism uh, in order to disseminate the information about threat intelligence across organizations. Of course, the information being shared would be these tactics, techniques, and procedures that are being used by the threat actors. Now, defenses at a personal level. 
In this demo, you're seeing the containment of some crypto locker being done through a product called Sandboxy. Very interesting product. It is very restricting as far as what can be run on your system, of course, if it's used and configured properly. So when it comes to browser security, you'll want to go with a browser that where the company spends a lot of money in its security model, such as Google. And of course, you always want to make sure that browser is up to date. Application blocking, you always want to block Flash and Silverlight. But if you absolutely have to run Flash, just make sure that it's a click to run. Glassware is a great product that can do network monitoring on your desktop and actually show you where IPs are located around the world that might be attempting to do something on your system. Network-based ad blocking. This can include proxy ad stripping as well as DNS sinkholing. Now proxy ad stripping can come through add-ons such as Provoxy and of course DNS sinkholing which is the uh, the actual dropping of domains with known malicious traffic coming from it can occur through great products like OpenDNS or Google DNS. Now host-based ad blocking, I recommend uBlock Origin. Make sure that it's the legitimate one and not a fake copy. And uBlock will actually give you this when you attempt to click something that is um, that has some known malicious activity associated with it. Host-based script blocking includes safe script and no script. Realize that this will break every website that you go to, but if you have the patience for it, this is certainly a very good protection. And then, of course, the sandboxy, which I had shown the demo of earlier. So in summary, these exploit kits have gotten really sophisticated, which means we need to step it up as far as our complexity in protecting ourselves. My references include the following, and if you like what you see, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or subscribe to me on Twitter.